Mine is everything from caddy spoons to candlesticks. And I think that makes it somewhat unique. I also think the fact that we live in a global world, why shouldn't I collect global silver? With a couple of exceptions, everything I own, I have been to those countries. And in reality, though, I find their best silver usually in London. Somehow, London and New York is where great silver migrates. They have big audiences. Well, I look for design first. Being a 43-year practicing designer, uh, I know design. And it's hard to put um, a frame around what is design. And for me, it's the design, and then it's the workmanship. You could have a beautiful design, but I actually have one thing that is beautifully designed, but not very good workmanship. And then it's the, uh, it's the beauty of the piece, in my mind, and it's how it feels and how it looks, and I have to have it. I have to put that piece in. And I always say, great design. If you go through my collection, it's probably there are 16, 14, 16 countries here. Um, it has no borders. You can design it in Poland, or you can design it in Scandinavia. You can design it in London or Birmingham. And it can still be great, just because the person who designed it was a good designer. And design has no borders. Well, this is a funny story. It's not collecting, but the very first piece of silver I owned, when I was 17 and graduated from high school, there was a very well-known jeweler in Portland. And his gimmick was every high school senior who graduated could come in and claim a free sterling silver teaspoon. And this was supposed to represent what you would want to collect as your um, dowry silver. And it was a way, I think, to get young women who got married very young. To, I gotcha, you know. Uh, I want to collect. And now, what do you know about silver when you're 17? Your likes change. But I really began serious collecting after um, a client of mine had some beautiful silver and one special piece in his office. And I really admired it, and I thought, you know, I don't know anything about silver. So I went to an auction at Sotheby's in New York, which is not far from my home, and there he was, the client. And he started talking to me and handling pieces, and this was, um, oh, these were 17th, 18th century pieces of very fine English, French, continental silver. And I was kind of listening, and he was talking about hallmarking and turning things over and weight. And so I went and bought a catalog, and then I started looking at the prices. And he was an investment banker, and of course, all the prices were investment banker prices. <laughs> they were up in the thousands. So I thought, this is not for me, but you know, I really kind of like it. But I'm not sure I like this particular silver. About two weeks later, I went to a famous flea market they have in New York called the Pier Show. And there was this woman, Rosalie, who looked like a little housewife. And I was able to buy two pieces of silver, small, but by good American artists, uh, I think for $300. So uh, it was just a matter of finding the right dealer and educator. And I learned a lot, and I bought a lot from her. Silver will be my legacy, not my career, because the silver lasts forever. There's silver from the 13th century. They paid 13 pieces of silver for Christ. I mean, silver is an eternal metal, and I wanted to find something that had a lasting value. This video has been made possible by the Wyoming Arts Council and the UW Art Museum Gala Funds.